and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The 17th time is the charm. Sri Lanka is in an IMF program which our leaders hope will allow us to get the nation back on track. But at what cost? President Rani Vikramasinghe told Parliament that if we did not adhere to all demands made by the IMF this time, we would once again be in trouble and the IMF would surely revoke its bailout. And how did the US tactfully manage to get us on our knees? And where do we go from here? To make sense of all this tonight, I will speak to State Minister of Finance, Shahan Sen Singha, Professor of Political and International Affairs at Princeton University, Professor James Reland, Professor of Economics at Sarah Lawrence College in New York, Professor Jami Maudud, Coordinator of Code Pink US, Marcy Vinograd, Senior Sri Lankan Economist Dr. Kenneth De Silva, and former U.S. State Department official Gaya Gamage. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. And a very good evening to all. As always, appreciate your company. We have a lot to get through tonight as well, so let's get right to it. What if everything you have been told is one big lie? And that sentiment worries me a lot. Again, let's take our country as an example. We are starting to get a better and a precise sense of what's going on after we have been told that once we get the IMF program in, things will get better. By the end of tomorrow, we will know whether the IMF was really concerned about putting Sri Lanka back on track or whether they are the face organization for the needs and wants of the United States. If that is the case, we will be told that until such time we get certain policy changes uh, that benefits uh, the USA or the IMF, aka like the Central Bank Act, they might not be able to provide us with the bailout money. We as a nation are banking on a so-called failing superpower and its way of governance just to allow them to use our resources, our land, our sovereignty and our independence so that this failing superpower can stretch its time at the top a little bit longer before its demise. In return, we are ruined further. Don't forget, for closer to 500 years, our nation was ripped off uh, from and used by these very Western overlords. And our leader seems uh, to not care about what they are doing right now, willingly or unwillingly. It's funny how uh, in San Francisco, they are paying African Americans $5 million right now as reparations for slavery. Where is our money? We are a bankrupt nation. Why? Right now, America's debt is at 123% of its GDP. Right now, the banking systems are failing and collapsing. Right now, that economy is crumbling down. Overnight, its second largest bank failed and is putting its economy in distress. Why? Because of erroneous policies implemented and supported by institutions like the IMF and the US Treasury. Very soon, Sri Lanka will definitely feel the heat of the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. It will have ripple effects on countries like ours because we too are implementing those erroneous policies here, pushed by organizations like the IMF. And when things go wrong here, do not once again start with useless slogans that don't mean anything. If you want to blame someone, blame yourself. <laughs> 
because you blindly followed and believed in that big lie sold to you at a time of your pain. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, in the past couple of weeks, did you see what happened to the rupee? It seems to have appreciated against the dollar, isn't it? Simple language, uh, the rupee is getting stronger. At least, that's what the central bank government have us believe. However, a disturbing report was published by Fitch Solutions. They say that despite these gains, the rupee will crash by the end of the year the report predicts uh, that the rupee will reach unbearable levels of closer to 400 rupees to a US dollar. However, the neoliberal economic pundits in Sri Lanka and their think tanks, um, more like empty-minded tanks, say that all our problems will end once the IMF comes through. But this is where Fitch Solutions disagree, uh, sticking with their forecast that the rupee will reverse course and drop 23% by current levels. Fitch Solution is of the view that disruptions to the IMF program and possible local government elections once again will destabilize the political structure and will lead towards more crisis in this country. Let's try to understand this insanity. Joining me now is uh, to get a clarification is Sri Lankan economist uh, Dr. Kenneth Jesilva. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for your time. Uh, good to see you once again. Now, despite the upward gain of the rupee against the dollar, Doctor, Fitch Solution thinks uh, that this is just a mirage and the rupee will once again fall. This time around, uh, they say 23%. Are they delusional or are we too optimistic? What's going on? Thank you, Mahesh. I think it's a good question uh, when uh, uh, rightly framed in terms of the Fitch report. Uh, I myself have not read it, but nevertheless, I think there are two parts to this. The first part is the rupee has appreciated for two reasons. One is uh, we have seen a contraction in economic activity across the board. I mean, if you look at the numbers from last year, we saw the economic contract by 8%, uh, so we had a negative GDP growth of 8%. This year too, we are estimating at around the economy will contract by about 4%. Uh, so with the contraction of economic activity, there is less throughput going into the demand side of the economy. Now that has resulted in a significant cash inflows coming through the economy, but on the flip side, there have not been uh, any significant imports. If you look at our, one of our major import components, which is crude oil, has come down by about 50%. Uh, the, the subsectors of that, if you look at uh, the crude oil demand, uh, crude oil demand, particularly diesel demand, has dropped by 50%. Uh, petrol demand has dropped by about 32%. Uh, kerosene has dropped by uh, 70%. So overall, there is a significant demand in the crude oil expenditure as well. So the outflows have been curtailed. That's on the demand side, plus on the restrictions that have been placed for imports. On top of that, we have also seen restrictions placed on debt servicing, because we have gone into a restructure phase. That restructure phase has not uh, uh, kind of enabled cash flows to be met for uh, debt servicing. So all in all, that could be appreciated because of those factors and nothing else. Now. According to the IMF, the rupee has to be free floated. And I think since we are on the IMF program, at some point of time, the rupee would have to be uh, traversing down that path. And eventually, trade liberalization, which is also part of the IMF requirement, would have to take place. With all this happening, I think what Fitch is alluding to is to what the IMF has put down on, it, on its conditionalities. And if those conditionalities are fulfilled, then the rupee will eventually head back or depreciate by another 20% is the overall understanding as per what Fitch is saying. Uh, indeed, uh, we have to leave it at that, Doctor. I wish I had more time. Uh, well, that was uh, Dr. Kenneth De Silva, senior economist, explaining what the report from Fitch Solutions might alert us to.
Now, whilst the US dollar seems to be uh, the stronger currency, uh, there are warning signs from the US of A last week. As I mentioned before, uh, two of their major banks crashed, mainly the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. And despite the U.S. Uh, government rushing to ensure that the rest of the banking system in the United States will not collapse, many analysts say that this is a tip of the iceberg. Watch. Yeah, well, it was hardly a radical uh, conclusion to draw when you slather on layers and layers of debt on an economy. Um, and encourage people to take reckless risk, and then you ratchet up interest rates at the fastest rate in history. I mean, God yeah. knows, we, the, the surprise is that it took this long for the bodies to float to the surface. But ultimately, the entire banking sector did the same thing, and that is that they watched their deposit base wither over the last 12 months while the Fed was raising interest rates, because right. people right. like you and me looked at it and said, why am I putting my money in the bank and getting zero when I can buy a treasury bill and get three, four, five percent as the Fed kept raising rates? So their deposit base was shrinking at the same time all those assets that they held that you talked about last night, the treasuries and whatnot, were declining in value. And they sat there and they did nothing about it, Tucker. And they didn't just do that for one month or two months, which might be excusable. But six, nine months go by and the problems are getting worse and worse and they did nothing. So the impunity of this banking system is beyond, but they've been taught there are no consequences for mismanagement and this ridiculous, uh, you know, all these ridiculous woke priorities, which have, you know, you should actually, when someone comes in and presents a business idea and wants a loan, you should be looking at whether it's a viable business model, not whether it's, you know, some sweaty teenager in a hoodie with some harebrained scheme that you can throw money at without consequence. But this is where we are. And, and sadly, um, I think we're just at the beginning of this because yeah. the companies that SV, SVB and these other banks uh, lent money to are all going to go belly up just like the clients of SVB started to do. Well, that was uh, Macro Maven CEO Stephanie Pomboy speaking to Tucker Carlson uh, recently, explaining exactly what happened in the United States. That side of the story is not being told in mainstream media because, you know, the the, the liberal-oriented media wants to uh, showcase to the rest of the world that everything in the United States, the banking system, the economy is perfectly okay. But But you know what's happening. Uh, many believe that things might get worse as we move on. Now with the US banking system collapsing and the recession of the US economy um, on the cards, will it spell out the worst scenarios for us here in Sri Lanka? And what does it really mean for this part of the world? Joining me right now from the data board is Danidu Tanamasam. Danidu, good to see you once again. Right now, Danidu, the question on everyone's mind is whether this crisis brewing in the West Will it hit us negatively or perhaps positively? Yes, Mahesh. So I think, uh, as you have clearly mentioned, there is going to be a negative impact all across the world. Uh, three things that I want to go over very quickly, Mahesh. Now, given the interest rates that have been increasing by the Feds, there is a chance, as in there is a, there is a record of money being pulled out of these emerging markets and back into the United States to reduce the, liquid, uh, to reduce the liquidity because the interest rates are going up. The people want the money to be back in the US. We see that as a very harmful effect to countries in Asia. We see three things that I just want to go over. One thing, we saw a 16% decline in the Tokyo uh, stock exchange for banks, a clear indicator on the day that the um, that Silicon Bank failed. Secondly, we see that the Fed interest rate is going up. As I mentioned, there is a pooling of money not only from emerging markets, but since Silicon Valley Bank was primarily in business-oriented things, these businesses, these emerging businesses have been affected. And finally, we saw the HSBC acquisition, given that it's a bank within this region, we see that uh, other subordinate banks of HSBC have also been negatively affected by that this. That is, uh, the HSBC one is in the UK, right? Then they're, they're not buying the, the arm uh, in America. That's the issue, Mahesh. Since it has been bought in the UK, there has been sort of negative connotation attached to the HSBC, which is why we are seeing an impact even in this part of the world because the banks function even in these areas. So a lot of things that we need to look at because there's a clear split in how economists have seen how the Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapse will affect this part of the world. Indeed, a uh, lot more to see uh, and, and we exactly know what the trend is, but a lot of uh, people don't want to talk about it right now, especially the um, liberal economist in Sri Lanka because their Western overlord is in trouble. They don't want to exactly. say anything, anything <laughs> bad. Anyway, uh, what happened to your show? I watched it last week. Uh, 
the public square. Good stuff. Uh, who, who are you getting next uh, next week? Well, next, I think you gave paved the way. We are going to talk about the IMF. We are going to take two oh. sides from it. Okay. Uh, we are going to get Malin Sariviratna and Rasika Jayakodi. It's going to be a very interesting discussion because I haven't seen that specific topic being spoken of, especially in the English medium. Uh, hopefully, a heated discussion. By the time you uh, go on air, uh, we will get to know whether the IMF has actually is okay with the bailout package and they have uh, given us that uh, uh, package, I think around $340 million exactly. is the first tranche exactly. uh, that we are looking yeah. at. Uh, anyway, Dhani um, Dutan was as always. Uh, thank you very much. Let's get more insights. Joining me now is a professor of economics at Sarah Lawrence College in New York, Pro uh, Professor Jami Maudud. He joins me via Zoom from uh, there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your time. Really appreciate it. Now, Professor, we have witnessed the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Signature Bank in the U.S., alarming a possible bigger underlying problem in the U.S. economy, similar to what we saw in 2008. Now, it seems to be the same case this time around as well. And if that is the case, how can countries like Sri Lanka, uh, whose economy is not that very big, uh, whether these adverse effects of a possible U.S. economic collapse? Mahesh, that's a great question. And I think it requires a longer conversation because, um, if the, as I say, if the U.S. sneezes, then the rest of the world gets pneumonia, right? I think uh, the short answer would be that uh, thoughtful policymakers and others in Sri Lanka and countries like Sri Lanka need to seriously rethink what development means. Now, I'm not saying that that will necessarily liberate the country, but look, um, I, I was when I was reading about the IMF's extended, uh, you know, uh, the the loan facility that was extended. One thing that really hit me was. Uh, and Sri Lanka has been to the IMF, what, 16 times since 1965? Yeah. Now, there is never any discussion about industrial policy. And the fact that this is a country, like all other countries, it needs to develop, as to be a sovereign country, it needs to have a viable industrial base uh, through which it can generate exports. Now, there's you don't have to look very far. Just look in East Asia. But you can also look in Northern Europe, right, where... Um, post-Second World War, there's a very concerted effort to, re to tie social democratic policies to export-led industrialization. Those are not antithetical. And I think that unless Sri Lanka and countries like this, uh, you know, sort of change the, the model, and this is not, by the way, a question of free trade versus protectionism. That's not what this is about. This is about rethinking uh, industrial policy and social development, right? Um, it unfortunately will be faced with the situation of pneumonia if um, the U.S. sneezes. And that's also a way for the country to reduce dependence on the regional powers in your part of the world, which are not going to facilitate the country developing its own manufacturing base. Right now, it... Uh, it um, imports pretty much all of its manufacturing goods and exports very low value added. That's got to change. Indeed. Uh, let's wait and see as to what will happen now. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. I wish I had more time. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, Professor of Economics at Sarah Lawrence College in New York, USA. Professor Jami Maldud. Just on a programming note, uh, Professor Maldud is my guest on Get Real this Tuesday at 7 p.m. So make sure you tune in as uh, there's so much to discuss about this economic crisis that is going on all around the world. Let's take a short commercial break. This is uh, State of the Nation. When I return, I'll speak to Professor James Whelan from Princeton University in the U.S. about the economy and the IMF program. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment.
This is the State of the Nation. Now, almost a year ago, Oxfam International made a statement against the IMF loan program saying that the International Monetary Fund must abandon demands for austerity as it only worsens the situation of a particular nation than helping it. That analysis by Oxfam found that 13 out of the 15 IMF loan programs negotiated during the second year of the pandemic in 2021 require new austerity measures such as taxes on food and fuel or spending cuts that could put vital public services at risk. Sounds familiar, isn't it? Now, despite all these warnings, our empty-headed th uh, tanks or think tanks led by the Colombo Liberals, have somehow got the government to believe that IMF is God. I mean, I have had ministers sitting next to me in my programs denouncing the IMF, which they are now worshipping. And not stopping there, they're asking us to do the same. Now, what is the government thinking? Will we get the IMF bailout or not by tomorrow? He is the State Minister of Finance. We are very confident that we will receive the program approvals and also I think going further the program approval is very vital for us. Uh, the president, the government of Sri Lanka, all government officials as well as people in Sri Lanka have worked hard towards uh, obtaining approvals. The reforms what we were doing are not the most easiest reforms to do as well as to absorb at a critical time like this. But I think all the reforms what we have done has uh, stabilized the economy that, and there is a very positive uh, sentiment uh, going on around the world that Sri Lanka is back in track and also that Sri Lanka has put the house in order. So basically once uh, receiving approval, the entire world will uh, get the message that Sri Lanka has put the house in order. I think that this level of confidence is very important for us to going forward because uh, one, it is not only the $2.9 billion which we receive uh, from uh, the IMF over a 48-month period, but we have to go beyond that. But we are very confident with all the negotiations what we have done and uh, with the acceptance of our transparency, our determination and the commitment the president and the government has shown, we are very confident that within this uh, time frame, we will receive uh, in excess of 7 billion US dollars from all the agencies that are supporting us as well as multilateral and bilateral uh, uh, friends. Well, that was the State Minister of Finance, uh, Shehan Semesinger, speaking to us uh, exclusively. Well, joining me now is Professor of Political and International Affairs at Princeton University, Professor James Reeland. He joins me from New Jersey in the USA uh, via Zoom. He's also the author of the book, The IMF and Economic Development. Professor, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Now, you have studied why I, what IMF reforms are capable of doing to a nation. Now, if you had to put it into a nutshell, what have you observed and what has changed with time? Well, first, Mahish, I just want to thank you for inviting me onto your program. Uh, it's an honor. And I wish I could tell you that the main conclusions of my book have changed. Uh, I published it 20 years ago. And the main conclusion is that IMF programs hurt economic growth and exacerbate income inequality thus doubly hurting those worst off in society, labor and the poor. Now, when it comes to the finding on economic growth, I would say that there have been some studies that challenge the, my findings. And perhaps that's because the IMF has changed over time. I think there are cases where economic growth isn't hurt and maybe even can be helped. Even though I think in most cases still, IMF programs tend to be contractionary, and especially if a country is not economically important to the United States, the largest shareholder of the IMF, then economic growth can still be hurt. But when it comes to income inequality, there really are no studies that disagree with my original finding. Uh, there have been some very recent studies by some excellent scholars in Europe um, who have reached the same conclusion using different methodologies and different measures. And the bottom line is that 
the distribution of the effect of IMF programs is not equal, and it does tend to hurt the poor. Indeed, uh, absolutely. Uh, Professor, now Sri Lanka's government has decided to go uh, with the IMF as the sole saviour of this nation. Now, by tomorrow, we will get to know whether God has answered our prayers. But the people can witness almost immediately that the pain these reforms are causing which is way too severe. Is there any advantage, according to you, uh, your opinion, Professor, for a developing country like ours that can be gained by going to the IMF? So for many years, the answer has been no. Uh, there really hasn't been much competition to the IMF. Uh, when it comes to the World Bank and development programs, there are other uh, options. But when a country is in dire straits like Sri, Sri Lanka is right now, um, there really traditionally has only been one major international institution that can bail them out. I think that's still true in terms of international institutions. The BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have a new development bank that countries are not really using. Uh, there's the Chiang Mai Initiative, um, but the Chiang Mai Initiative, where Japan and China are the leaders, um, re actually requires an IMF program to be in good standing. So when it comes to international multilateral efforts, the IMF is really the only game in town. That said, there are bilateral lenders. And of course, the big one is China. Um, and China does offer a different approach, um, perhaps less austerity, um, at least these days. I'm not sure that's going to last. Um, I'm not sure that necessarily going to China would be the right answer, but knowing that China is an option might give some leverage to the government for a stronger negotiation posture with the IMF. That said, I do think that the IMF goes in with some good intentions. One big change we've seen over the years is that the IMF now always discusses the poor and talks about the importance of maintaining a social safety net. The fact that we don't see a change in the economic impact on the poor suggests that that might just be talk or perhaps country's own governments, your own government isn't doing enough to implement the, the, the social protections for the poor. Makes a lot of sense, uh, Professor. I also want to get your take on some uh, geopolitical issues. There seems to be a cold war brewing between, between China and the United States. Sri Lanka has become ground zero, Professor, for this cold war. How do you see this cold war playing out? Will this escalate into something of a world war status? Well, I obviously, I certainly hope not. And uh, wars, fortunately, do tend to be rare, especially amongst large powers. So I wouldn't predict that. Um, but that doesn't give much solace to a country like Sri Lanka, uh, countries like Nepal, countries that are really in the crossroads between uh, China and the West. Um, I do think that the competition is going to continue to heat up. I think that the recent pandemic uh, kind of has hurt the economic ties across these countries, economic ties that have uh, encouraged um, countries to seek peace. I do still think that we have one advantage because of the global integration of markets. During the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, we used to talk about mutually assured destruction, which was bleak, but perhaps a safety that neither side would start the war because we would destroy each other. That's still there with the United States and China, but we have an added protection of mutually assured economic destruction. And the fact that economies ar around the world are so tied, hopefully there are interest groups within every country that will lobby their governments to maintain some modicum of peace so that those economic transactions can continue because we really do depend on each other for survival. Indeed, uh, thank you. That was a uh, professor of political and international affairs at Princeton University, Professor James Greenland, all the way from New Jersey. Let's take a short commercial break. And upon our return, we will uh, tell you what Victoria Newland, possibly the most dangerous woman on the planet, is up to. This is the State of the Nation, back in a moment.
Nation now with a lot of geopolitical influence going around. Tonight, I want to focus on one individual who is quite prominent in shaping the future of our nation. It's none other than uh, Victoria Jane Newland, the United States Under Secretary for Political Affairs. Even though we've attributed a lot of influence of the United States spread uh, by the current ambassador, Julie Chung, here in Sri Lanka, it is vital that we understand who the real puppet master is, which many say is Victoria Newland. Who is she? What's her goal? And where sh does she want to take this nation to? In every instance, please keep in mind that Victoria Newland is working for her nation, the United States of America. Now, in Western media, she is dubbed the undiplomatic diplomat. This was uh, after a leaked audio conversation back in 2014 where she uttered the words F the EU with regards to the Ukraine war, which I played, I think, about a couple of weeks back. Uh, indeed, if you were asking Ukraine war back in 2014, yep, Ukraine was at war at that time as well, and thanks to Victoria Nula. And if you thought that Vladimir Putin is a monster and is uh, doing everything to further the power of Russia in the world and actually pushing the Russian Federation to good old days of the Soviet Union, then meet her US counterpart, Victoria Newland, who is equally evil and deadly, not just to America, but to the rest of the world as well. Victoria Newland, the current US Secretary of State for Political Affairs, is struck, uh, stuck in the old um, ideological days of 1950s where US-Russia cold war politics and dreams of continued NATO expansion and arms race on steroids and further encirclement of Russia and a possible escalation with China to keep America as a global superpower. She's working hard for that. Now how dangerous is Victoria Newland? And some interesting people showed up at the protests, including then-Senator John McCain, who was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time, um, Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland is like handing out cookies to people. We have pictures of them meeting with these opposition figures who are very much calling for the government to be overturned and that the tra trade agreement be signed with the EU. Then in February, there is a phone call that mm -hmm. is leaked and it's between, like you said, Victoria Newland, the lady handing out the cookies from the State Department, and our then ambassador to <laughs> Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt. And so in that call, she says, as you alluded to, Yachts is the guy, Arseny Yachts and Yuk is the guy. And she says, Biden is willing. And everybody focused on the EU instead of focusing on the main point of this, which is like we're planning a, a change in a government of a different country. Well, that was a clip from a podcast uh, from journalist Jennifer Briney, who has extensively uh, investigated about Victoria Newland back in the past, and she has come forward in order to expose all what she has been doing thus far. Now, Victoria Newland represents neocons who leads U.S. foreign policy. This has, this has landed America trillions in debt to be paid by ordinary American citizens. Victoria Newland holds the third highest position in the State Department. When the U.S. attacked Afghanistan, Newland was the permanent representative of NATO from 2000 to 2003. She ensured U.S. and NATO established bases and remain in Afghanistan to tap into its natural resources. When the U.S. attacked Iraq, Newland was a foreign policy advisor in the years 2003 to 2005 to then Vice President Dick Cheney. She planned and managed the war that toppled Saddam Hussein and made a case regarding bogus weapons of mass destruction. Then the U.S. went on to occupy Iraq and over one million Iraqis are dead and thousands suffering post-traumatic stress. These were all collateral for Newland, who was more interested in security, economic and political interest that benefits the United States. Newland continued as U.S. envoy to NATO from 2005 to 2008, where she coordinated allied support in Afghanistan and Iraq. Her boss, Dick Cheney, was the former CEO of Halliburton, who was given $39.5 billion in federal contracts related to the Iraqi war and one of the profiteers of the U.S. occupation in Iraq. When the U.S. decided to liberate the Libyans from Gaddafi in 2011, Victoria Newland was a State Department spokesperson under Hillary Clinton, who is famous for laughing at the death of Gaddafi, where she said, We came, we saw, he died. 
The nation that had the highest standard of living in Africa is today a failed state thanks to the mastermind of Victoria Newland. When Gaddafi was toppled in 2011, Newland next eyed Syria. In January of 2012, she claimed the US was on the side of those wanting peace will change in Syria. The Libyan arms were passed on to insurgents to overthrow the Syrian government. The US went on to supply sniper rifles, grenades and missiles to the peaceful protesters. And at that time, Newland worked very hard to justify regime change operations in both Iraq and Syria. Noteworthy is the pattern and rhetoric related to peaceful protesters in Libya, Syria, Ukraine and after that here in Sri Lanka as well. Now, the U.S. regime change strategy follows a pattern. It's a very simple pattern. First, the U.S. backs peaceful protesters. Then the U.S. criticizes the local government for a disproportionate response. Then the U.S. exerts pressure not to take action to that government while increasing support for proxy protesters. After paving the way by instigating the war in many Middle Eastern countries, Victoria Nuland eyed Ukraine. When Newland became Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs in September of 2013, it's noteworthy that the manor uprisings began soon after her arrival in Ukraine. Ukraine had to decide uh, to accept an IMF loan, which meant a 40% increase in natural gas bills, or accept a Russian loan with cheap oil and gas. The opposition of Ukraine wanted the IMF loan. This was when the February 2014 audio recording of uh, Newland talking to the U.S. Uh, envoy to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pryor, was leaked. That's where she said F the EU. Clearly, Newland was interfering in Ukraine's internal affairs. She was directly meeting opposition leaders and managing the protest. The reason I was talking about the Ukraine issue in 2014 is because that coup was very much similar to what took place here in Sri Lanka. Many say that Newland has been in the thick of US foreign policy covering coups, proxy wars, aggression occupations, to even sniper killings. With all the above records, uh, when, you, um, when Newland arrives twice in one year to Sri Lanka, one has to wonder not only why, but what she is up to. The first time she came and met with former President Gotabi Rajpaksa, he became a wimp and fled the country. The second time, well, we had to wait and see as to how that will play out. Right now, many believe and were read on social media that the push by Newland is to set up a military base here by possibly pushing the AXA agreement, which was rejected by former President Rajapaksa's government back in 2019. Why do they need a military base here? Basically, to prep their war efforts for a possible escalation with China. Now, the arrival of high-level military personnel of the U.S. government, backed up by the interfering uh, diplomacy of the current U.S. ambassador here in Sri Lanka, uh, it looks like that the U.S., especially Victoria Nuland, wants Sri Lanka to be in her corner. Most Colombo liberals and their fellow minions will never understand when someone from here says that she's bad news. After all, they all drunk the Nuland Kool-Aid too much. But hopefully they will listen to someone who is from the United States itself. Joining me now from Los Angeles, California via Zoom is Marcy Vinograd, who is the coordinator of Code Pink, a non-profit fighting for peace. She is a long-time anti-war activist. Marcy also served as a Democratic National Committee delegate to Bernie Sanders in the 2020 presidential election. Marcy, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me. Uh, to give our viewers uh, an understanding, explain to us, Marcy, uh, what your organization's uh, key focus is. Thank you so much, Mahesh, for inviting me on State of the Nation. It's a great honor to be with you and your viewers today. I am, as you said, an organizer with Code Pink. This is an organization led by women that began in the run-up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq to object to that, to object to the occupation and the many wars that the United States has launched in an effort to remain the global power, the superpower of the world. We believe that there should be equal rights for all in Israel, Palestine. We have a campaign to cut the Pentagon budget, which is now nearly a trillion dollars with 750 military bases, US military bases around the world. And I would urge all of those watching to oppose any establishment of a military base in Sri Lanka.
Marcy, uh, listening to what you just said, uh, I, uh, I understand that your organization is a very liberal, progressive organization wo working specially for women's rights. Then how come you say that Victoria Newland, the current U.S. Under Secretary, for, uh, Secretary of State for Political Affairs, is bad news? And why do you want her fired from her position? Victoria Newland is really like the poster child for the neoconservatives who Mahish have been pushing for remaking the world in the image of the United States for decades. Uh, she was an advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney, the architect of the U.S. occupation, the U.S. invasion of Iraq. She sold the uh, occupation, the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan to Europe, said, come on board, you know, we can win this. 20 years later, the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. It is broke. We have stolen its money. People are facing starvation. She also supported the, uh, the coup in Ukraine in 2014. Now, this was a pivotal point, right? Uh, we have to go back in history and look at what was the U.S. role in Ukraine? How did we end up in this position where we are facing a U.S.-Russia proxy war with the two most heavily armed nuclear nations of the world threatening World War III. Victoria Newland was right there in Ukraine at the Maidan Square encouraging the overthrow of the democratically elected president. She engineered the transition government. She was recorded on a phone call saying F the EU, the European Union, should they oppose who she chose to run the government, the post-coup government in Ukraine. She was all down for sending arms to Ukraine to arm the civil war that broke out in the aftermath of this coup and that undermined the peace agreement, the Minsk Peace Accord in 2015. And now Mahish, she is out there campaigning. She's a saleswoman. She is selling US funding attacks, Ukrainian attacks on Crimea. This is really, really dangerous. Crimea, we know, was annexed by Russia in 2014 following this coup out of concern that their naval fleet would be evicted. OK, uh, Crimea was part of Russia for nearly 200 years. It's not going anywhere. So this is really a red line for Russia. The U.S., we don't need a direct war with Russia. We don't need any war with Ukraine, with Russia. We need peace. And we want our administration to be in the vanguard pushing for peace talks. It is not. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we see in this part of the world, which is not much of a focus in America, that Victoria Nuland is prepping Sri Lanka as a location to put up a U.S. military base in a possible escalation with China. Do you think this is another sign of a new war for America? I'm afraid, Mahesh, that that's what those in power in Washington be they Democrat or Republican, the two major parties in our country, that's what they want. Uh, they want to take on China, which is insane. China, China has a 1.5 billion people. It owns over a trillion dollars of U.S. debt. Uh, it is an industrial giant, the largest exporter in the world, the largest manufacturer of semiconductors. And the United States wants a war with China? Uh, Sri Lanka must not be caught in the crossfire of this insanity. We cannot uh, encourage anyone in Sri Lanka to support the establishment of a U.S. military base. Number one, U.S. military bases are notorious for contaminating the land, the water of the places where these bases are established. So if you want to ruin your land, if you want a super fun site that's like toxic central, uh, then you would want a military base. But by and large, the larger picture is we don't want Sri Lanka to be a pawn in a U.S. war with China for global hegemony. China is emerging as a, as a peacekeeper, you know, having just negotiated a peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, having offered a peace platform for resolving the war in Ukraine. What is the U.S. doing? It's sending $10 billion of weapons to Taiwan to prepare for a war with China. What is the U.S. doing? The U.S. is goading Ukraine to widen this war with China, with, uh, with Russia rather. It is sending what to date 50 billion and counting in weapons and military assistance, in quotes, to Ukraine when anyone, any reasonable person would say, we need to end this war. Let's apply diplomacy, not the weapons of war. That will only increase global insecurity. 
Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, Marcy, if all of us fail to defeat this insane hunger towards war by Victoria Nuland, what do you think would happen next? What ha would happen next is that uh, the United States and China would, would face off in a potentially uh, existential threat to the entire globe, right? Both countries are possessors of nuclear weapons. The United States has a nuclear posture review, a nuclear policy that says the United States will use tactical short range nuclear weapons, any nuclear weapons in a first strike should our allies interests be threatened. We've seen Victoria Nuland and the rest of the neoconservatives and the Biden administration and previously in the Trump administration vilifying China and setting us on a trajectory for a war with China. This is disastrous. Sri Lanka should have no part of this. I ask the leaders of Sri Lanka to shun the likes of Victoria Nuland and Samantha Power and Jake Sullivan and Antony Blinken, four neoconservatives in the Biden administration who are leading this drive for war with China. We have to say no. We have to say no in the United States. And we stand in solidarity. Code Pink stands in solidarity with the Sri Lankans who say, no, we're not going to be part of this war with China and the United States. We will not allow a U.S. military base on our land. Leave now. Absolutely. Indeed, leave now, Masi. Despite you knowing, living and understanding the dangers of such women from the United States itself, it's a long way until our people really come to their senses. It's a sad story here, but I hope it will be a positive one in the days to come. Thank you very much. That was the coordinator of Code Pink in the US, uh, Marcy Binokrat. Let's get another perspective on this story. Joining me now is Daya Gamage, who is a retired Foreign Service National Political Specialist of the US Department of State with over 25 years of experience. He is accredited to the political section of the American Embassy in Sri Lanka. He joins me now via Zoom from Las Vegas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gamage, for taking the time to speak to me. Now, what are the key intentions of the United States in Sri Lanka? Is it to form a military base, uh, taking advantage of Sri Lanka's uh, weak economic status and doing whatever they want to do? Actually, Mahesh, it, uh, the question can be uh, divided into two. First is that see the, see the amount of people who came from Washington. Deputy Secretary of uh, Political Affairs of the State Department, Victoria Newland the second highest ranking foreign policy person in the State Department. In February, she arrived here. This was her second visit within uh, one year. Then came again the CIA director, US CIA director, William Burns came here uh, two weeks ago. Then on February 27th, that is very important, This two weeks ago, February 27th, the Kotral Defense University participating uh, partnership with the American uh, Embassy uh, launched a publication uh, entitled the Sh Shared Vision for the Indo-Pacific Implications for South Asia and discussed the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. So these are the th first th the things that you know that that happened really during this time. Now, why are these things really happening? Because you know because they have already identified Sri Lanka as a m m m m located in a very strategic position in the Indo-Pacific region, right in the middle. So, uh, so uh, 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 that that's also, uh, all these things started really when exactly a year ago, February 22, uh, February 20, uh, 2022, the Biden administration released its long awaited Indo-Pacific strategy. Previously in June, 2019, the U.S. Defense Department unveiled the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report in which Nepal, along with Sri Lanka, was added to United States uh, partnership program in the Indo-Pacific. So these are the these are the things that that the, 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 the things that happened really when all these people came. Really, hopefully, hopefully, uh, I hope a lot of people will come to their senses very soon. Thank you. Uh, that was a retired foreign na uh, service national political specialist of the U.S. Uh, Department of State. Diane um, let's take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. I'll be back with a closer.
Well, today we are witnessing a tug of war between trade unions fighting against the current tax regimes and the government. As usual, we can uh, witness the arms of certain parties creeping into the public uproar to garner some political mileage. Another tug of war is occurring as to whether or not an election is required. It seems to me like there is always some distraction occurring in front of us which uh, is loud and colourful. What behind the scenes a manipulative bunch is creating the platform required for their own insidious agendas. On today's program, you heard from officials in the West about what sort of character Victoria Newland really is. Consistently, you have heard a pool of economists from different parts of the world tell you what the IMF really is. The reason for that is not to upset Sri Lanka's recovery. It's, to, it's because we honestly don't see that Sri Lanka can come out and be strong by going to the IMF and being in their program. We haven't drunk the Newland Kool-Aid or being brainwashed about the IMF. Therefore, we will fight to expose the bull they continue to tell the Sri Lankan people. Read between the lines. That's my message to you tonight. Because if we start doing that, we will stop making these colossal mistakes. It is paramount that we read between the lines, especially during a time of panic, loud noises and waving of red flags. Sri Lanka is full of these situations. Cutting through this will definitely be painful in the short term, but it will be a method to salvage Sri Lanka and make Sri Lanka strong, meaning make you and me strong. As you and I approach a new week tomorrow, if we solely focus on making a few decisions, both in our personal capacity and professional capacity to read between the lines, the so-called system change we all want would occur. The system change starts with you. On a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. Do check us out. The State of the Nation podcast available on Apple Podcast and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us at Other Than 24. Have a good night and a productive week. I'll be back again on Tuesday at 7 on Get Real. My guest this week is Professor Jami Maudud. Make sure you catch that. Have a good night.